Hello, everybody. Thank you for join, joining us today for New Mexico's Women's March conversation with Congresswoman, Congresswoman Deborah Holland and candidate Teresa Leger Fernandez. Uh, Deborah Holland made history in 2018 to um, join about 102 uh, women who made a historic uh, wins for the House, and she's one of two indigenous representatives. New Mexico was very proud to elect, uh, to elect her and be a uh, part of history in the making. And Teresa, God willing, you'll follow in that lead and, and we'll, we'll, we'll have three of you representing this, an all women team, women of color team, go to Washington this, this uh, coming election. But um, first, I would like for you to self-introduce yourselves. So, Ms. Deb Holland, take the mic. Thank you, Sam. Yeah, sorry. I'm still, like, not with it on the technology stuff, so I apologize. <laughs> Thank you all so much for being here, for inviting us, for um, giving us an opportunity to just talk with you. Um, everything Samia said, um, you know, my parents uh, are veterans. My dad and my mom met uh, when he was in the Marines and she was in the Navy. I have a 26-year-old daughter who just had to, you know, came off of my, um, who came off of my health insurance um, because, you know, she's of age. And so, you know, I'm fighting for health care every day when I'm in Congress because we need that. And, um, and I, um, I raised my daughter as a single mom, so I know what it's like to be on food stamps, to piece together health care, to, you know, figure out how you're going to um, make ends meet um, when you're living paycheck to paycheck. So I just understand what people go through every single day. And, and that's why I, I want to fight to, to, make, to make things better for people. I'm honored to be here and will be very, very thrilled to have Teresa as my colleague um, come January 3rd. Thank you. Thank you. Teresa, please take it over. We can't hear you. So I am from Northern New Mexico. I was raised in Las Vegas, New Mexico as part of one of those huge families, right? My uh, father had 14 siblings. There were nine of us. Um, and um, it was a wonderful way to grow up, right? On the Eastern side of the mountain, uh, spending time in the villages that were my parents, um, you know, where my parents were from and where in fact, we still have ranch and farmland. My brothers and I uh, have it jointly and are preparing it for regenerative agriculture. Uh, went to uh, school, started, I always say I already start, I, always, I started my academic career in Head Start, uh, but then I got to go uh, away to Yale and Stanford, but came back yeah and worked with Deb Hollins of uh, Preblo for 30 years. Uh, so I've been an attorney for about 30 years doing a wonderful kind of stuff. I am so lucky for the work I've done. It ranges from, you know, working with the Preblo of Laguna on, they made history. The Preblo of Laguna was just always willing to do things that changed um, the way the BIA worked, the way the USDA worked, all kinds of stuff. So wonderful stuff. A lot of stuff also dealing with uh, Latino issues since I'm a Chicana. Uh, and uh, so I would do that, you know, on the other side. So a lot of voting white stuff. I'm a mother. Those are my twins back there, but I'm a mother of three sons. Um, and uh, have done a lot in raising them and been kind of, you know, the main, the main person. There's a, there's a father in their lives, but I'm the one who's primarily responsible for mm. most things we've been, you know. So you know how sometimes that happens? <laughs> you're yeah. you're kind of like a single mother, right, on a lot of things. Um, but, you know, on just, it's just, it's just, you know, Deb sometimes says, you know, you struggle too, and I think, well, yeah, right, because we've lost, you know, I've had, I think as, as women, we end up having to carry a lot, like, you know, carrying, uh, taking care of my mother and my father as they were dying, right, that fell to my sister and I, but then I lost my sister uh, to lung cancer, lost two brothers to addiction, so I've suffered through, you know, a lot of the pain, you know, almost died a couple of times, once in childbirth, wow. um, yeah, so, you know, just, 
I think as women, we carry through a lot and we just, you know, it's just, it's just what it is, right? And so we keep moving on stuff, right? We, we all have different stories of, of, uh, of things that we've overcome, I think. Well, thank you for that, ladies. Um, let's start with the first question. Again, it goes over um, some, of, some of what I had mentioned in the intro. In 2018, we saw a historic midterm election for women, especially for women of color. 102 women elected to the House, 14 to the Senate, and nine new governors. Rashida and Ilhan were the first Muslim women to be represented in the House of Representatives. AOC was the youngest. Deborah Holland and Sharice Davids are the first indigenous uh, women to serve in the House. Deb, can you please talk about your experience uh, in Congress? And then Teresa, as a woman of color, how have you been impacted by the 2018 wins? Deb, go ahead, take it first. Thank you so much for the question. You know, I am, it's, you know, I'm proud to have been sworn in with, with this historic class of women. And I feel like, um, you know, one of the things we joke about, um, I was talking with Rashida one day, and one of the things we joke about is how, you know, like you've always heard that uh, mem members of Congress are, you know, the most millionaires and the member, and like, I'm like, I didn't even have a savings account when I ran for Congress. I, we joke that we've lowered the, uh, you know, the income or the wealth, <laughs> the wealth of, of, you know, the Congress in and of itself, because so many of us are just normal people who decided to run and, and won our elections, right? Because we've, we knew what was at stake. And so um, I think that us, you know, some of the, and I think you can tell like who we are by the legislation that we have introduced. Ilhan and I, uh, I co-sponsored, she, she led the bill, she allowed me to co-sponsor, you know, the, the lunch shaming bill so that kids aren't, um, that kids aren't put it, you know, they're not shamed because their parents can't afford to pay their lunch bills. We, um, you know, Rashida has been a strong voice for water, right? She, she's, uh, she knows what the people in Flint, Michigan went through. And, and me and Sharice working hard on missing and murdered indigenous women. And I feel like a lot of our colleagues have, um, they've really been supportive of the things that we're trying to do. And I appreciate that so much. So I'm gonna keep this, this past election. I mean, I've been helping women win their elections since I got in here. We were able to help in some of the primaries uh, in fact, I helped Teresa. I endorsed her before the primary. Um, I know like, you know, you end up like people get mad at you when you do that. But the thing is like, it's, it's, if you know that, I mean, if the purpose in electing people is to make sure that, that you are choosing somebody who is the best representative of the people in that district, then I mean, you have an obligation to stand up and say so. And so I felt obligated to, um, to, to endorse the best candidate I knew for District 3. And that's why we, we went out, you know, we sort of made a few people mad by endorsing Teresa. I just felt like the people deserve to have her representation. Um, so too with some of the Senate candidates in the New Mexico Senate. Um, that was against the norm, and I, I sort of got a strong talking to about that. But I, I just, I was tired of, of you know, you can be a man, and you can support women's issues, and if you are a man, you better support women's issues. That's right. That's right. Otherwise, we can elect women who will support our own issues. So it's sort of up to you, right? That's right. um, and so that's, I, I made my voice very clear in the, in this New Mexico primary as well. And, you know, a few folks weren't very happy with me, but I just feel like we, you know, it's time for everyone to stand up for, for our people. And, and so I'm going to keep, I'm going to keep supporting women. And it's not just, yeah, we're going to get you, you know, we're going to get your campaign up and running for me. It's all the way. 
And I feel like I've shown that with Teresa when she comes to Congress, I mean, we're not just gonna, okay, you're on your own now. And I mean, it's a commitment I make. I wanna see her become a very successful um, representative for District 3. So we're gonna help and help her navigate the place. We're gonna, you know, help her, you know, the fastest way to get to the Capitol building. Uh, I mean, I, I, I'll help her with all of those things because I think that she, if I make a commitment to someone that that is a long-term commitment. So. I think that women, you know, we can all do that for each other. Thank you. Teresa. It has, been, it has been marvelous actually having um, Congresswoman Deb Holland, you know, have my back uh, because it did make a huge difference, right? It was a very competitive primary. And um, Actually, her and I cried, you know, when she called me up. And that's the other thing. Us women can cry together. Like, we don't have to hide our emotions. And I always say that you only cry about things that you love, right? When we care deeply, we will cry. And that's not a bad thing, right? And yeah. so, you know, she called me up and it was the middle of, you know, the pandemic was just wrecking havoc with uh, our Native American communities. And I know those communities, you know, there was nobody else in the primary who knew those communities who had helped put clean water in some of them, right? Um, and, but also knew how many others didn't and how many others, you know, tr I tried to put broadband in six of the Pueblos and, you know, mm. our, our application got rejected, right? And so like, I know the kinds of things that have, you know, where the money is and where we haven't been able to pull the money down from DC, right? And so, was, you know, we, we talked and we, we literally cried because, you know, we lost some amazing um, leaders, leaders who, you know, carried great spiritual wisdom in them and, you know, we've lost them. Um, so, you know, having Deb come up and say, I'll, I'll hop you out, her chief of staff is, you know, giving her advice and, you know, she's just been amazing in that way. But the other thing is the other women have as well, right? So uh, they're inviting me, even though I haven't run yet, they invite me to participate in policy forums uh, with them. And I love showing up uh, because you learn so much. You learn at what they're already talking about. You know, we, we, um, I got invited to participate in a policy forum where we had people talking, experts talking about what would a woman of color economic agenda be, right? That's yeah, right. yes, right, Karen, right? Yeah, right. Let's get a woman of color economic agenda. But guess what? A now woman you're talking our language, by the way. Yeah. You're talking our language. But you know what? A woman of color economic agenda is also an all women economic agenda because it is dealing with the, you know, the earned income tax credit, right? I did a T with Rosa DeLauro, which would take, you know, if we fix that, right? We'd uh, right now, you know, people earning four hundred thousand uh, dollars. Congress people get it right. Four hundred thousand dollars get earned income tax credit, but the poorest don't, and the most world don't, and a lot of our, you know, Navajo families don't. We would actually literally take about fifty percent of our kids in New Mexico out of poverty, right? Those kinds of things where they bring you in and you go, but wait a minute. You know, sometimes, because the disproportionate impacts are horrible. Right now, we know that the COVID economic impact has been hardest on women of color. No doubt. Harder than everybody else. It hits men worse, but in terms of economically, it's the women of color who have hit, been hit worse. And especially Latinas, Native Americans, and African Americans are the worst coming out, why? Because they are in the jobs, they are in those kinds of jobs where they've been laid off. They are some of the essential workers who don't get to do the essential work anymore. They are in the service industry. And so those are the kinds of things that we are gonna need to say when we do, you know, they're trying to do the second heroes bill and Mitch McConnell is still not listening to it because he sent everybody home except for to get, you know, to push through the next Supreme Court justice who is gonna do awful things, right? But he won't deal with things like they put in their heroes bill, which would address some of the issues that are really hitting, 
you know, our women. So there is, there is a wonderful sisterhood there. Uh, and they immediately reached out and, you know, uh, talked to me, you know, Deb is like, well, we have space in our building, you know, they're all helping out, you know, in different ways. So uh, I'm, I'm going to like commute with Deb, we're going to walk to the Capitol together, because they have, <laughs> there's all kinds of wonderful people in that building um, uh, that is just like filled with, you uh, and, and they do fun things together too. It's like, oh, I can't wait to go and, you know, have sister fun. <laughs> so you so know, it's inspiring, but also embracing. And the other thing is that, that shame, you know, th let's really thank Congresswoman Holland. You know, New Mexico was also one of the ones that brought up the issue of the lunch shaming through Appleseed. Right, I mean, we right. have amazing organizations and dedicated people in New Mexico. And, and, and what you saw there was Appleseed brought up an issue and then they had a Congresswoman who was willing to take it and make something happen with it. And that's the thing that is happening is Deb is a collector of problems. This is my latest thing about how I think about Congress people. They're a collector of problems and so that they can create the solution. And some of those problems break your heart, like the work she's done with MM, you know, Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women, which I hope she'll talk about. But look at what she's done. How many bills have you actually gotten passed through the House and the Senate? I mean, for her to have two, three, four, nobody gets bills passed. And she already has. She is amazing. What's the secret, Deb? What's your secret? Well, I, I think somebody, some organization rated me as the the top freshman lead, the top freshman member of Congress with the most bipartisan bills. Mm. So I reached across the aisle. Look, my, I, I am a very proud progressive. The progressive agenda is inclusive of everybody. That's we right. don't exclude anyone from our agenda. We want everybody to, to, to we, want, we want our policies to support the entire country. And I think like some of those, it's hard for Republicans to say, well, you know, okay, you're right, right? Like my Chaco Canyon bill to protect the Chaco Canyon um, 10 mile radius, that was bipartisan. And, um, and so we, we need to just continue to uh, reach across the aisle. Um, and, and of course, um, you know, I try to support, I, I just think like all of it's building relationships. You know, my last day of my criminal law class when I was in law school, um, my criminal law professor, the advice he gave the students was, the most successful lawyers know how to play golf. Meaning, uh, build those relationships. Reach out, make sure that you have allies and people who are going to support you in your endeavors. And that's exactly what I, I have tried to do. Um, and I think that's, that's what we need to do. But I, I think I'm rated like the fourth most progressive or something like that in, in Congress, so. That's wonderful to hear. I'm sure you, you brought in um, uh, a culture that was necessary for, the, for, for that space. And uh, I'm glad that New Mexico was able to have that representation. Um, from the sound of it, it looks like you all have a plan to get all three of you to uh, up to Washington, D.C. So it'll be all, all three uh, women elected. And uh, I wonder, though, I have to ask you, how has COVID-19 impact the pandemic uh, affected your run? Because you ran before, Deb, and you would know the comparison and how has it affected you, Teresa? Impacted your run. Do you want to go first, Teresa? So, you know, what it's done is it's taken away one of the things I love the most, which is really um, the interaction and the listening to the stories, right? Right. Um, and and it is, it is I, I sort of describe it as I'm, I'm like, and I think that this might be you know, maybe the best people, right? That you're, uh, I'm a little solar panel of energy from other people. It's like, I don't, I hope I'm not stealing their energy, but I hope we are creating friction and energy am among us. And so it's really funny because you can have an incredibly hard, you know, you have 15 events, but you know, you're exhausted to get to the next one, but then you get to that one and you, you, you engage in some, somebody tells you, 
some little wisdom about, you know, what their need is or what their belief is or what they work on or something. And you just get energized by it. And that's the sad thing that's missing. Mm -hmm. Um, but, you know, it is, it, the, you know, what everybody else is going through is so hard. And so that's actually the other thing that's been hard is that, you know, to really, to really touch in and, and pop in and, and he, feel what people's pain are. You, it's hard to do that over Zooms um, because they don't have time to Zoom, right? And, and so that's the difficult thing is we can't be out there with people who are hurting hard, right? And I think somebody, and, and it's harder for me because I'm not an elected person. So, you know, all of my stuff is campaign. I can't go the way Deb could go or that so she could go. I know they've gone out in their official capacities to listen and to do things that they can do in their official that I can't do because I'm a campaign, right? And so that's been the hard part. We've switched, you know, we do teas. Our, our last tea is going to be on the 14th about cultural issues of Deb might be joining us. We have to get the dates out to her. Uh, um, and so, um, you know, because we want to create this that's another story, but I want to do uh, make sure that we in our WP that we actually uh, cover creative and cultural stuff when we go and do the big recovery in January. And so um, we're going to be we've done teas around various issues from child poverty to storytelling. We had storytellers last week. That's amazing. That's awesome. Uh, Deb, you want to comment on that? So just with that, with respect to our campaign, we have, um, we, we got, we created a new website. We felt it was better, easier. We wanted to make it easier for our uh, voters to connect with us. So we did that. Of course, everything's been on Zoom. We're following all the guidelines and trusting science, unlike some people are, um, you know, no, uh, uh, women for Trump bus tours for us because uh, none of those people wear masks or social distance. And so um, I have to give kudos to Marg Elliston, our, um, our uh, party chair, who has really um, made use out of those, the Zoom and getting people together. So I'm super happy about that. I mean, I have, you know, I've had lots of roundtables. I've met with a lot of people. I make a lot of phone calls. It's just everything but, you know, face-to-face -face communication. So, um, so I look forward to, you know, the day when we can all meet together, of course. I agree. It's been really hard not to have um, interaction with community. Uh, it's, it takes a toll on you. I know a lot of people are very depressed, people who don't have families. Depression has hit, so it affects all of us in a different way. So my next question is, um, we'll start with Deb, Congresswoman Deb. I hope you, you don't mind me calling Deb, you Deb, it's fine. Call me Deb anytime. You'll always be anytime. Deb to me. <laughs> Can you please update us on the, on the latest in relief funds uh, legislation? to help New Mexico women in their families during this pandemic. And then Teresa, how will, um, oh, sorry, I messed up on the question. Teresa, when are you, when you are elected, how will you advocate for New Mexico? Go ahead. So a quick, uh, I'll give a quick update on the Heroes 2 Act that we passed the other day. And we might have to go back um, you know, the Republicans don't want to help anybody. That's just the bottom line. And that's why they are so against these bills that we pass. But the Heroes 2 Act gives strong support for small businesses, uh, improves the Paycheck Protection Program. A lot of those businesses are women owned. Um, it gives additional assistance for airline industry workers. Uh, a lot of those workers are women. Uh, it more funds to bolster education and child care. We know that those both those industries are predominantly run by women. So uh, 225 billion for education, 182 billion for K through 12 schools, 39 billion for post-secondary education, 57 billion to support child care for families. Um, the updated HEROES Act also maintains key priorities 
from the legislation that passed the House in May, the first HEROES Act, providing the absolutely needed resources to protect lives, livelihoods, and the life of our democracy over the coming months. And those include, um, uh, you know, money to, uh, to, help, uh, pay, to help our frontline workers, first responders, health workers, people who keep us safe. Um, it supports testing, tracing, and treatment. Um, I mean, everybody should get a test. We need to, we need to really ramp that up. Um, and, um, you know, make sure that people can get the care they need once they are diagnosed with the test. Uh, it provides additional direct payments. And, you know, we heard all the Republicans complaining about everyone making more money, you know, by staying home than working. I mean, look, if they're making more money with the, with the unemployment and the stimulus, they weren't making enough money in the first place. So let's pay our workers even more. That's I mean, right. it, it just doesn't make any sense to me. So, uh, so I'm all for that. I'm not gonna, you know, they, it's terrible that they're even saying things like that. I mean, they, our bill continues to do everything, food security, housing assistance, uh, and it safe, safeguards our democracy. You know, we had passed a bill to protect and, and you know, help the postal service. Uh, that is still an issue, and we're going to continue uh, fighting for the Postal Service and everything else. So the Heroes 2 Act has, has, you know, it's just a, it's a, it's a, we had to take money out of it because every, they thought it was too much. And so um, it's just kind of a, a, a version that's been slimmed down, um, even though we didn't want to slim it down. Thank you. Teresa. So uh, because we know that uh, um, Mitch uh, and President Trump won't sign what really needs to happen, um, so we anticipate, I anticipate, we anticipate that 2021 will have that big, the big recovery bill, right? Um, which is bad because we really need it now. But on the other hand, with the President Biden, Vice President Harris, Hopefully Mitch McConnell no longer having that position, whether he's lost it because he lost the election or yay, we got rid of him, right? And, and it's going to be women. There are several women senators who are going to make that happen, right. Um, right? So, so uh, that we will then at that point in time have to do the big recovery bill where Democrats in each house, in each branch, will need to say, this is the time for the new deal. And this is the time to restructure, to really rethink what do we need to our society to start looking like. I'm going to really, you know, I've been talking a lot, uh, and Biden has too, about the concept of let's expand what infrastructure should be. Let's make sure that infrastructure, the way I like to say it, is what we need for our communities and businesses to thrive. And what that means is it's not just clean water. Um, and our 20th century infrastructure, but that because in too many places we don't have it, including in New Mexico, on Navajo, in Flint, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But it's also the broadband, it's the clean energy grid, the renewable, you know, let's start using the need to come out of this recession, the funding that we're gonna put in it, let's not do what we did in 2008, which is let's just get us out of the recession, but nothing's changed. We need to come out of that recession and change things, including, as I was saying earlier, we're the WPA. Um, you know, uh, I, we all know that we get to walk and go into our mountains and we get to look at beautiful murals and uh, photographs and, you know, all kinds of stuff because the WPA put people back to work, creating what we needed and New Mexico really needs to have our creative uh, econ economy jump started again. And so that's something that we really need and know. And so that's the conversation we're gonna be having in two weeks, but that's like a big thing. So, you know, I know what the state I think is as reliant, but a lot of cities are, and a lot of people are, and that was such a successful element back then, but what should it look like now, right? But I think the thing is that we need to start restructuring where we should be so that we're not, when, when I hear Biden say build back better, 
it really is different. It's not the old way, right? It's the restructuring, the new view. So I think it's going to be a lot, a lot, a lot of work. Um, and it's going to be great to have more, you know, um, representative Congresswoman Holland has so, done so much encouraging other people to run across the country. I'm actually also now trying to help out in my little way, you know, other women across the country, other women of color across the country as they are, they might not be as in a place that I am here. So I'm helping them out in uh, other places. And so that's why when you help us, we are then able to help others, right? And I think that that's, that's what we do, right? We always want to pull others along and strengthen, strengthen those numbers of both progressive and women of color. And not everybody can be a progressive. There, some of them were flipping uh, states, but it's important to have that too and to say they can't do certain things because their district doesn't let them. But it's so important to have that voice here as well. Well, well, uh, you kind of touched on um, the green energy and the, um, the direction, the shift that we might have from changing a, a, an extraction um, and military based economy, shifting it to more of a new energy kind of economy. Uh, if you could touch on that more in regard and kind of bring in the impact of how President Trump pulling out of the Paris uh, uh, climate summit has impacted all of that work. I mean, it's put a lot, so much to, to a halt. So what will you do? And then uh, what are you hoping for actually with the new president coming to town? How will things shift? What's the first thing you do if you get a new president? Do you want me to go first? Yeah, Samuel, why don't you or? go? Because you actually, you, you have a perspective of you were sitting there as he was doing some of this. So I, I, I mean, um, you have a lot to say. So, I mean, what hasn't he, you know, it's sort of like, what else, what hasn't he done? You know, the Paris, the Paris climate agreement is like the least of these in a way, cut off big swaths of bear's ears, cut off big swaths of Grand Staircase Escalante is pushing to have gas and oil on uh, in Chaco Canyon. You know, our bill passed the House, it didn't pass the Senate, and it didn't get signed by the president. Um, he, he has uh, desecrated so much of our public lands and refuses to, um, you know, do anything. And that happens when you have gas and oil lobbyists uh, running the departments that uh, should be keeping a watch on these things. So um, additionally, um, I mean, look, the offshore oil in Florida, the, I mean, everything that Trump has done, it's because he wants to make more money or he wants the people who donated millions of dollars to his campaign to make money uh, so they can donate to him again, I guess. Uh, I mean, the, it's, it, climate change is real. It's the biggest threat facing our planet. We have to move into a renewable energy revolution, which I believe New Mexico can be a global leader in. Um, I, ha I am uh, very supportive of, of, of course, the um, Energy Transition Act here, and uh, will do everything I can to assist the state in that endeavor. Um, we also, and I'll just say that uh, Joe Biden has committed to so much on the environment, the 30 by 30 resolution to save nature, to preserve 30% of our land and waters by 2030, that will help with, um, with bringing the um, uh, carbon emissions down. Um, uh, uh, he has, he, Joe Biden has um, uh, uh, promised to to renew our, us into the Paris Climate Agreement and so much more. I am actually on Joe Biden's uh, um, uh, uh, commission. I'm sorry, sorry. Uh, it's the Environmental um, uh, Advisory Committee. Uh, the Campaign uh, Environmental Advisory Committee and uh, so we meet once a week, uh, several of us. We have uh, union leaders, environmentalists. It's a small group. Tom Steyer's in the group. You know, he's a champion for the environment. Uh, we meet once a week 
And um, we've had roundtables with tribal leaders. We have roundtables with young, you know youth advocates for the climate. Uh, we're 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 bringing in. We're getting ideas. We're giving those to the campaign. The campaign is very very serious about climate change, which I'm very happy for. And so we'll keep pushing that forward. I'm an original co-sponsor of the Green New Deal. I have my I introduced my Thrive Agenda, which addresses climate change, unemployment, you know, as a result of this pandemic uh, in communities of color to bring us all together and move our environment forward. So um, I, I think that with this new president, we'll see, uh, we'll see some incredible change. That's and good. She's also she's also done an environmental justice bill act, and so a lot of what uh, you see uh, many of the women leaders doing in the House is even though things aren't going to get passed by the Senate, they're not giving up. So they're writing these bills and they're passing them and they're working on them and they're getting input and they're doing stuff so that, you know, I'm assuming, <laughs> though I haven't asked that, right? So that when we get there uh, and when we have a new president who's likely to sign them, we, there can be quick movement because they've done all this work. And I'm really thankful for all the work that, uh, you know, Deb has done with regards to teeing everything up, getting everything ready, even though we can't get patch pitch, all that hard work is not going to be lost. It's then going to be rolled in so that we can take a lot of action because what we need to do is say, we might only have a short window. Um, let's take advantage of that window. Let's be, you know, the words I use is bold and courageous action to protect what we love. And there's nothing we love more than our mother earth. And there is nothing that will cause us more pain. Um, the COVID crisis is going to pale in comparison if we don't address the climate crisis. And, right, right. And so, so we need to do it. We need to get uh, busy on it all. And, and what I love, what campaigns should be about is not just who wins them, but what is the conversation and how do we move forward? What does that conversation doing the campaign lead to? What kind of ideas come up? And that clearly happened in our presidential, right? And people might not like the fact that there were so many running, but when you think about it, all those different uh, candidates who ran added something to it. And let's give it to what, the process. I mean, Biden came out as the nominee and he has said, I listened to this and I listened to that and we're putting this in, you know, and Steyer, will you come be on this task force and let's do um, the unity, uh, uh, you know, the unity platform, a lot of things. So that's the important thing that happened. So yes, I'm Green New Deal, I'm all of that. And we need to move New Mexico out of this boom and bust economy because it's not good for us. Uh, you know, my opponent is a petroleum engineer um, and her family is part of an oil and gas company. That's what they have. But now she's claiming she's an environmental engineer, right? And so we need to be honest about that's not the same, right? Somebody who's truly trying to protect the environment is not actually saying, let's be, let's be doing more of this. New Mexico needs help doing this transition too, right? Yes, you do. And the bills that they have set up, the Green New Deal bills acknowledge that. They acknowledge that we need to invest in those communities that have borne the brunt of the fossil fuel, that have borne the brunt of uranium, like we know in Navajo and at Laguna and all of those places. We need to invest in to bring the health up, to clean up that stuff. And actually a lot of that cleanup, a lot of that pulling the methane out of the air, that's gonna, create a lot of jobs for a while. And we need to recognize that what the Green New Deal is doing is saying, let's get things fixed and create some opportunities while we're at it. I love, I love the concept that came out of that. Thank you, ladies. Uh, so Deb, we have 10 minutes left. I know you're on a crunch. Um, there's a lot of questions I have for you. Uh, I'm going to go, uh, first, let's talk about the missing and murdered Thank you. Sure, sure, sure. So, um, so the first bill that we passed was Savannah's Act, and that does um, that will create that will um, be will have better data sharing. Sorry, 
better data sharing between uh, law enforcement agencies. So, I mean, look, when, when there's a, you know, depending on where um, this crime happens, um, you could have tribal police, Bureau of Indian Affairs police, you could have county sheriff, you could have the state police, you could have the city uh, police, right? Like there's any number of law enforcement agencies that would, it would be in their jurisdiction. Um, and we want to be able to share data between all of those so that we can, so that they, everyone knows and is on the same page with one, you know, with an issue that happens like this. Um, it would also uh, require the Department of Justice to create some training programs um, for, um, for law enforcement officers uh, to uh, know and understand what this issue is in the first place and how to deal with it. Especially if it's, a, you know, part of the problem is we want to be able to identify these women um, as native and where they're from um, because they're family members. I mean, they're the ones who are out there uh, searching, you know, in the forests and the, and the trees for their lost loved ones. Um, the, the second bill we passed was the Not Invisible Act of 2019. Uh, that will create a, um, a uh, commission of a tribal uh, leader, uh, victim or victim's advocate or victim's family, um, uh, um, law enforcement um, folks uh, to come together and uh, make recommendations on the laws, the bills we need to pass or the policies that need to be implemented or how we need to deal with this issue. These are two bills that will move toward the solutions for missing and murdered Indigenous women. However, when we think about that this crisis has been happening since the Europeans came to this country in the late uh. 1400s, it's going to take a lot more to untangle it. Yes, sir. We're making a start. Thank you. Thank you for your work and um, thank you for being a voice for missing and uh, murdered indigenous uh, women. And for women in, in general, um, this has impacted all of us emotionally. It's impacted different community, women of color communities as well. So it's very educational. Teresa, can you stay on past six, uh, past six, past six o'clock? Are you uh okay? For a little bit, we actually have something else scheduled. I'm, I'm scheduled like five, six, seven tonight. <laughs> it's, I can it's, imagine. I'm, okay. I'm sorry, I was trying so hard to get on and I just couldn't. Yeah. That's, no, 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 it's no problem. It happens to the best of us. Um, okay, let me uh, jump on to uh, this political moment. How the Black Lives Matter uh, movement has impacted you. What have you done and will do to address this systemic change in, in our institution? Uh, Deb, do you want to go? Maybe Deb, maybe if Deb goes first and then I can stay on and answer while she heads down to see her mother. Uh, so would that work, Deb? Yeah, I mean, we still have a little bit of time too. So I have six more minutes. Uh, so let me take a couple more minutes. <laughs> Thank you. I feel like what George Floyd's death did in our country is it, it, you know, everybody rose up. It was just the time when everyone came together to rise up and just say enough is enough. We're tired. We don't want racial injustice any longer in our country. Anyone who's saying that, uh, that racism is over in America is not paying attention. And you need to listen to us because this this needs to change. And um, so I am, you know, as soon as that happened, I had a number of round tables right here in my, we had to do them by Zoom, uh, but I wanted to get input from the black community here in my district. Um, I was, I attended George Floyd's funeral in, um, te in Houston, Texas with, um, with my colleagues. I wanted really to support um, my colleagues in the Black Caucus because, um, you know, they took this so much to heart. These are issues they had been working on for such a long time. Um, and I co-sponsored the Justice in Policing Act, the George Floyd Justice in Policing Act. And that, of course, you, you probably saw the top lines, right? 
uh, no more chokeholds, no no-knock warrants, no, uh, I mean, treat people with dignity and respect is, is the way they should have been. And you know what, what also sort of caught my mind on this was um, that George Floyd's murder happened in Minneapolis. And in Minneapolis, back in the 60s, the American Indian Movement was created. And it, that was created out of police brutality toward indigenous people on the streets of Minneapolis. You know, I read some of the stories. They would do things like when they went to arrest um, a, a Native American, they'd handcuff him, throw him in the trunk of the car, and drive to the police department. That's how they were treating people. And so the American Indian Movement was formed to protect, they wanted to protect their people from That's police great. brutality. And so, um, so this, I, I feel an affinity for uh, Black Lives Matter. I think that we all need to show that we're allies. And when you're true allies, you, you know, it's not just sitting back and, and, you know, reading things, it's actually getting out there and saying, uh, this needs to change and we're going to be a voice for people who don't have a voice. So um, I trust, I, I am going to do whatever I can to find justice for all of these people. I want, you know, I want us to legalize marijuana. I want every black person who was thrown in jail because of a marijuana charge to come to, to be, you know, to get out. We, we have jailed people for so many ridiculous crimes and that is not the way we should be as a country. So, so I, I'm just gonna keep working on this issue. And of course, I'm honored to stand with the Black Caucus in the Congress and, and the issues. Um, me and Hank Johnson, a, my good friend and colleague from, he's from Georgia, uh, he's he's been working very um, for a very long time on the demilitarization of police, and um, and I have co-sponsored um, legislation with him. So I'll keep working on things like that and um, and follow the lead of my colleagues who have been in there fighting on this issue for a very long time. Thank you. Uh, can you t can you t briefly talk about the impact? Uh, of the passing of the notorious RBG, the Supreme Court uh, will have a new nominee, a new um, a replacement for RBG, and uh, you know, talk about the women's rights, reproductive rights, uh, Roe versus Wave, the Affordable Health Act, Care Act, and the uh, uh, Social Security, the impact on Social Security. If you could talk about that. Well, what I'll just say very quickly is there should be no confirmation uh, until inauguration. Uh, it's plain and simple. We, uh, we know why they want to ram this through because they want to take away health care, because they want, it to, they want to overturn Roe versus Wade. They want to, um, they want to, to, to you know, challenge equality and, and all of these things. So, um, so we are, it's not anything against the nominee. Um, she is who she is. Uh, we don't want the process to happen because uh, it's not happening. It's not what the American people want. Uh, they're being hypocrites if they do it because the last time uh, they made an argument just precisely 180 degrees yeah, from what yeah. they're making now. And so uh, we're going to keep fighting that as well. So, um, so thank you so much, everyone. I'm really honored to be here. And thank you, Teresa, for giving me and uh, staying a few minutes behind. And uh, I really appreciate being with all of you this evening. Thank you, Congressman Deborah Holland. We look forward to having more questions with you. Absolutely. Thank and, you. And another session. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. I didn't say out of your mom. <laughs> so the other thing that I think to remember with regards to Roe v. Wade is how important the state of New Mexico is. Um, that given the likelihood of this, uh, this potential justice of overturning uh, Roe v. Wade, we are gonna need to turn to statutory protections for women's right to have okay. access to reproductive health care. And that is possible and we need to do it. And the really good work that was done to get rid of those Democrat male senators who were not voting the right way 
yes, right? It's like mm -hmm. you, if you don't want to vote the right way on this issue, you, we, we shouldn't keep voting for you. And having those women uh, defeat them was important. Um, and I think that that's a really key thing that we are going to need to do. And we're going to be able to, you know, we can address that at the, at the federal level, but really uh, places like New Mexico then become crucial for that issue. We need to be able to be flexible and agile. You know, we'll move to something else because that we need to keep protecting a woman's right to make that difficult decision, right? In consultation with those she loves, her provider and whatever faith she chooses to you know go to right that's her decision nobody else. absolutely women have a right to choose have a right to organize their their life their 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 standard of living their education and you know in the case of rape incest i mean that the, the the choice the right to, to decide should never be uh, anything we should give up actually um, uh, so i'm gonna i have to move to my next event so i will say that i think that, that is the thing that we need to really always push um is is part of that that um that sort of full equality for who we are right on all that's of right. Right. i know i know that's what we did in getting rid of this president uh, will be so key, but it's just one of a first step. That's but right. It's, that's this is a long haul. This is really hard work. So uh, I'm being uh, called, saying you need to get up. <laughs> well, Teresa, I'm going to call you. I'm going to call you for another uh, meeting. So yes, we have more, yes. more than likely. It's just we get we get, we, get, we go from one to another to another. Anyway, thank you, thank you thank for you. Your, thank sending you so all much. the great information in the chats and thank the tools. Okay, thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.